the temple that Solomon is building is now complete. The process now, well, making dedication. I like the idea of dedication. I mean, I really do. And it's amazing because if you'll recall, it wasn't too long after we were in this building, now almost 10 years ago, coming up on 10 years, yeah, that we, that we had a dedication. And I don't know, were, were any of you here for the building dedicate? Put your hand up. Wow, not many. Look at what God's done in the meantime, right? Very cool. But just so I can tell you what happened since you weren't here. The place was packed. We had fellowships from all over the community. The other Calvary chapels as far away as Reno and Truckee and South Lake Tahoe had people here. And Carson came in. And Gail Irwin, one of our favorite people, was here. He was the one that, that kind of hosted things, if you will, and, and carried it along and brought a message. And we did a building dedication. But, you know, it really wasn't a matter of dedicating the building. I mean, the building is the building. What we were dedicating that night, what we were standing in the path of, is first giving back to God what He had given to us, what could be perceived as giving to us. God, this is Your building. But even more so, the people that will come here, Lord, we're dedicating those to You. Same way when we do a baby dedication. Have you ever noticed that it's very seldom about the baby? It's normally about the parents. Oh, the baby's up here and steals the show, right? Unless they're sleeping or making a mess. But it's wonderful because the babies are up here and they're doing their thing. And it's really not the baby, unless they look at pictures later on, won't remember the event. But it's about the parents. It's about dedicating our hearts and our lives to the Lord, to His calling, to His purpose, and in that dedication being reminded. And so I love what, what Solomon is doing. is he's, he's bringing now back a remembrance. He's going to talk about what happened through his father, what God promised through his father, in this process of bringing about the dedication of the temple. Now, it's very possible that within the next couple of years that we will be looking to dedicate what will be even yet a new building. And I can't tell you what's going on because nothing's going on yet. But there's a lot of things happening. There's just not anything going on yet, right? There's a lot of things in motion. Nothing has landed yet. Everything's still circling the airport right now. But when we do come to that point in time, Lord willing, that we are dedicating once again a structure, a building, brick and mortar, to the Lord, it will be not as His dwelling place, it will be the place where His people come to worship Him. And it will be that we are dedicating once again ourselves to Him. And in this case, Solomon and the children of Israel are, are in a little different situation. In this case, the presence of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, the, the, the essence of the Lord is actually dwelling within the temple. It's the visible sign. It's not a matter yet of what's been given to us by the Holy Spirit to where now the Spirit of God dwells within us at this point in time. His physical presence, the Shekinah glory, the essence of the Lord was dwelling in the tabernacle, was dwelling now in the temple. And we'll see the Lord arrive in a pretty spectacular way in just a few verses. But it says in verse 6, Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said that He would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell forever. Then the king turned around and he blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have chosen no city from the tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. Nor did I choose any man to be ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well in that it was in your heart. I love the fact that God looks at the heart rather than the outside. And God says, David, your heart was right, man. You wanted to do this. The problem, well, for David, he wasn't allowed to build the temple. God told him, I'm not going to let you build the temple. You're a man of war. There's too much blood on your hands. It's not your calling. I haven't called you to fulfill this aspect of it. That will be done through someone else. But it's not because you wouldn't. 
It's because I wouldn't let you. But it was in your heart. And because it was in his heart, the Lord counted that honorable to David. I like that. And I think that there's going to be times in our lives that there's things that we really want to do for the Lord, but the reality is, is based on our circumstances, our resources, or some other reason, we just can't accomplish it. It may be because of health concerns. It may be because of something as simple as work schedules that get in the way that we're not able to get out of for a period in time, and we have this desire to do something for the Lord or to serve in a certain capacity, but for that season, we're not able to. And the Lord says, I see your heart. I know your heart in this, and I know your heart is there for it. And it doesn't mean that we can't do everything that we can to support it, but we may not be the one that is called to fulfill that specific thing. Now keep in mind that along with this, that there's kind of an other side of the coin. It means that the Lord sees what's in our heart. And so while we may be not able to do that which we would like to do, we also may be in the process of being caught doing that which is meant more for us than the Lord. 1 Corinthians in 3, in verse 11, it says, For no other foundation can be laid that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one wor- works will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now if you were here a while back, we had opportunity to show the movie, The Bema Seat. How many of you were here for that, right? Great. If you haven't seen it, go up online, Google it, and find it. It's The Bema Seat. And watch a, about an hour-long so presentation of, of this rendition of what some believe The Bema Seat to be. But what The Bema Seat is, is the judgment of works of the believer. Well, it's not judgment as unto salvation. As it says, it's not a matter in this particular case of, of, of loss that would be in his salvation. It says, you'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so through fire, meaning that our salvation is intact, but the works that we do are going to be judged. Some are going to be gold. Some are going to be silver. Some are going to be wood and hay. And when you put fire to those elements, some stand and some don't. The wood and hay and the stubble. And those are the things that we do Oh, maybe thinking for the Lord, but seeking some sort of reward on our own. Maybe it's the thing that's done pridefully. Maybe it's the thing that's done with self-serving motivation. Maybe it was, it was something that started out good intention, but it kind of turned around. And I think it's going to be interesting when we stand before the Lord, just what things wind up standing the test. You know, we have a tendency to, to kind of go through our lives and think, wow, that was something that I, that I did for the Lord. And the reality is, is, well, maybe we did it for ourselves. And then there's things that we don't think we did that may be the things that stand out the most. But the idea being so clear, in either way, God is going to judge that which is to come. He says in verse 6, so he says, Yet I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there. I like that. It's interesting, while uh, Jerusalem as a part of the land was granted, granted to Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, they never possessed it. You remember, it wasn't until the time of David when he went in and ran the Jebusites out and took possession of Jerusalem that they were actually able to lay claim to it. And we talked about how it is that, that it became the capital city and it was a good way for that to come about because there hadn't been a particular tribe that had laid hold of it. And yet it's also interesting that God declared that he would put and establish his name there. You guys want to pop that up on the board for me? All right. Hold on to that for a minute. We'll get there in a second. While we were in Israel, we learned some amazing things. One of them was is that we got introduced to the 21st letter of the, the Hebrew alphabet. And the letter is Shin, or it's pronounced Sheen. It's S-I-N, but we would pronounce it S-H-E-E-N. And it's the letter that the Hebrews had chosen to represent the one true and living God. And it's this letter that you see on different artifacts and different things. It's printed on the mezuzah, which is what we see right here. This is, this is a mezuzah. 
And what they would do with this is they'll take and they'll put a scripture within the back of this and they'll roll it up and they'll affix this to the doors. And, and, and it's the scripture that comes from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And it's called the Shema for them, but it's called the, the, in English it would be to hear. And Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and, you will, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and as you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The idea, real simple, was that this was going to be the Word of God that was going to encapsulate and, 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 and infatuate the, the, the people and the children of Israel. They were to keep the Word of God handy and in their minds and in their present and in, in everything that they do. And one of the ways that they do this today is they do it through the process of this mezuzah. They put it on their doorpost and it's got the Scripture in it. And every time they go past the doorpost, they'll kiss it with their hand. They'll... they'll, they'll, they'll and they'll, they'll, they'll touch it, and it's this constant reminder. Every door that they walk in, as it says, when you go in and when you come out and when you stand up and when you lie, and then there's this process of what they call frontlets, right? And I've heard about them, but I never saw them practice, obviously, until at the Wailing Wall was where they were most common. And a frontlet is this box that you see here. And this is a box, literally, that is, that is banded around the head, and it carries that same verse, that Deuteronomy verse, and they take and they put it on their head, and they wear it as a frontlet. As a con now, you can't go anywhere and not be reminded that you have that thing sticking out of the front of your head. And then they also said to bind it to their arms, and so we saw many, many that had this binding, this cord, and within that there would be also another box that would be, be tied to that, very similar to this box that would be bound to their to their hands and what they're doing is very very literally taking what this verse says in deuteronomy and they are practicing it in a legalistic way binding it to their heads binding it to their hands taking it and and putting it on their doorpost but the thing that i love about it so much is not that i think we should practice these aspects but i think that the idea of keeping it in our mind keeping it in our hand and keeping it everywhere we go especially in our homes the Word of God is incredibly important. I think that not only is it important, but I think it's one of the things that we can learn from the faithfulness that we see taking place here. But this letter Shin, it's interesting. This letter Shin, yep, back up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Looks like a W. I mean, basically, this is the letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the 21st letter, that is their representation of Yahweh. This is the representation of the one true and living God. Any Hebrew that would see that instantly would know that's God. That's the name of God. And when you look at a map of Israel, this is the thing that's so amazing. This is Israel, and you have within the topography of here when you look at the number four up there the number four is the Teropian valley the number five is the Hinnon valley i'm sorry the number four is the kidron valley back up number four is kidron number five is the Teropian, and number six is the Hinnon. and the valleys converge and i don't know if you can see this or not but between where the valley comes here and here and here that forms a shame and God said, I've chosen Jerusalem because I will put my name on it. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that that's very cool. So when we look at this, <laughs> ah, so when we look at this, you see the three components. You see over here the Kidron Valley. You see the Teropian Valley in the middle, and the Gehenna Valley over here on the left-hand side, they all come together, and the valley, the layout, the land, in relationship to how Israel is built, in, or Jerusalem is built, forms perfectly the letter that is that which is designated for the name of God. That's cool. I think only God could probably do that. What's even more interesting is, is that they would not have had the topographical view of this that we do. And so I don't know if they knew it or not. 
but I know somebody that did. All right, you can go ahead and shut that down now. Thanks, guys. All right, I have chosen Jerusalem for my name. But continuing on in verse 9, talking about David, nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and set on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the temple for his name or for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I have put the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with the children of Israel. So Solomon now starts declaring the promises and the faithfulness of God. And even though he's talking about how he has completed this process that was handed to him by his father, it's based on completely the promises that God has made. And then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands. For Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. He had built a stage in the middle of, of the Temple Mount area up there in order to be able to, to, to lead the people. And it says that he stood, or that he knelt down on his knees before all of the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands towards heaven, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven or on earth like you, who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised to your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying you shall not fail to have a man set before me on the throne of Israel. Only if your sons take heed to the way that they walk in my law as you have walked before me. And now, Lord God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David. But indeed, dwell with men on earth. But will God indeed dwell with men on earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day, toward the place where you said you would put your name, and that you would hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. And may you hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place, And when you hear, forgive. One of the most amazing things that we saw was the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall. And it's a very ominous place, and it's truly that. It is the Western Wall of the Temple Mount, and it's really the only area that the, the Jews are able to go that is considered sacred to them in order to be able to worship. But it was explained to us that this picture here is exactly what it is that the devout Jew is praying for. They truly believe that literally this wall, this temple, this place represents a window from heaven to them. And that as they are there in front of the wall praying and and, and seeking the Lord, that God actually sees them. And this is exactly in line with what we see going on when the temple was built, in Solomon's prayer, when he said, Lord, see those who are standing here and praying. And then what's the bottom line? What does he say? See us, hear us, and forgive us. And this is the prayer of every devout Jew that is standing there, along with the restoration of the temple on the, on the mound up above. But they're there because they truly believe that this is the place that God sees them as based on what we see here given in scripture and if anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple then hear from heaven and act and judge your servant bringing retribution on the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness now it's interesting because as part of this dedication as part of this prayer that solomon is 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 making he's going to start directing his prayer specifically at different aspects of the of the jewish life and here what he's talking about is he's talking about the justice system He's talking that there would be righteousness and that it would prevail within the legal system, within the justice system of Israel. 
And then he goes on in verse 24, or if your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you and, and return and confess your name and pray and make supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back into the land which you gave them and their fathers. The next area that Solomon addresses is the military. He says, I want, I want to first, I want to, I want to pray specifically for the justice system and now lord i want to talk about our military and i want it to be blessed but look at what he does he ties the victory he ties the success of the military to what to faithfulness to faithfulness and a willing to confess willingness to confess sin this aspect of there being being this need to confess in order to be able to be successful he says and when you shut up the heavens and there's no rain because they have sinned against you and when they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants your people israel that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on the land which you have given your people as an inheritance next commerce crops prosperity in relationship to to that which would would be tied to the economic aspects of israel i mean guys it, it, it's amazing that everything that, that, that solomon is talking about has to do with sin if there's a problem in the land he doesn't say oh lord and fix the problem he says no when the people confess their sin when you bring this upon us and we come and we confess then heal then secure then provide then he moves on and when the famine is in the land and pe pestilence and blight and mildew and locusts and grasshoppers and he goes on and he talks about how it is that that all of these things that would come across again as they would come and they would pray and they would make supplication that you would hear and that you would heal their land and this is that aspect of praying now against natural calamity and and health issues and 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 even for the nation and personally he says not only on a national level, but this would happen on a personal level, that there would be this, this aspect of returning and coming back to you. Moreover, in 32, concerning a foreigner who is not of your people, but has come from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arms, when they come and pray in this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls, for you, calls of you. And the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel. And that they may know that this temple, that this temple which I have built is called by your name. The next area in verse 32, what did he address? Immigration. Wow. This looks like it'd be a great prayer list for today, wouldn't it? These are issues that we're dealing with. And when your people go out against battle against their enemies wherever you send them and when they pray to you towards the city which you have chosen and the temple which i have built for your name then hear from heaven their prayers and their supplication and maintain their cause okay 34 and 35 foreign policy when they sin against you for there is no one who does not sin and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy and they take them captive to a land far or near Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done wrong, and we have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity where they have been carried captive and pray toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen toward the temple which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven. Your dwelling place their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you now my god i pray let your eyes be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place do you guys remember when daniel was carried off to babylon you remember when it came down to the point that he had had the challenge of not praying to god his habit was to take and to turn and to face jerusalem and and to face the temple where it would be located and to pray three times a day he was literally following if you will this direction that solomon had prayed in this prayer about when you're taken off when you're held captive when you're away but again everything that we see 
that is tied to the healing everything that we see that is tied to the restoration that is tied to the prosperity that's tied to the protection that's tied to the immigration policies that's tied to to the government and the justice system is tied to the people acknowledging their sin and asking for forgiveness and guys that's what's lacking that's, that's what's lacking in this nation. You see, if, it, if it's anything outside the church, and, and sometimes even inside the church, we're going to see that in a moment, the people of, of, of the world are not even accepting the fact that they're being, being led in paths of unrighteousness, that they're sinning. You go try to approach somebody that has no spiritual discernment or understanding or the things of God, and you try to explain to them this aspect of sin, and they look at you like you got three eyes. They wonder why it is that we see everything affected in, an, in, in a negative aspect, that we see our commerce being affected negatively, that we see our education system running amok, our political system is running amok. Everything that's happening right now, we wonder why it is that everything is all messed up. One word, sin. It's what it is. And it's where the problem lies. It's not in political programs and more money and more opportunity and, and, and these aspects of trying to figure out. You know, it's amazing, and I've, I've talked about this before, how I'll, I'll sit and listen to, to educators with good hearts. There's a lot of great teachers out there talk about how it is that they can't understand what's going on in the schools. And so the, 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 the concern is, is that the kids don't pay attention. The concern is that the kids have no respect. The kids have absolutely not only any, no respect for them, but no respect for their parents and no respect for their peers, no respect for themselves. And they can't figure out why. They can't figure out why kids bully kids. Oh, we have a huge bullying po problem, and we got these great policies and everything, and there's this, all this focus on bullying, and, and we got to do an anti-bullying campaign, and we have to teach people not to be bullies. Well, you're not going to get people not to be bullies unless they have a reason not to bully. The only reason they're not going to bully is they recognize that somebody's bigger than they are, and if they don't know God, they don't have anybody bigger in their life than they are. The minute that they've got God in their life, they recognize that there's a need to not take and to force their will on someone else because God doesn't force his will on us. But guys, as that is missing and lacking within, within our country now, we see exactly the things that are happening based on, on the same conditions that were going to take place in Israel. Now therefore, in verse 41, Arise, O Lord God, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. At this point in time, it's amazing because Solomon, although we're going to see, it's just so close to the edge. He's displaying part of that great wisdom that he asked God for. He's displaying through, through this prayer this desire for God to reign and rule in every aspect of government and commerce and even the lives of the people and through and, 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 and in spite of their sinful nature. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of, Lord, of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the, on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and they worshiped and praised the Lord saying, for He is good and His mercy is endures forever you see when god's people pray and they worship sincerely god shows up and he showed up here then the king and all the people are offered sacrifices before the lord the king solomon offered listen listen <laughs> a sacrifice of twenty two thousand bulls and one hundred and twenty thousand sheep and so the king and all of the people dedicated the house of God and the priests attended to their service and the Levites also on instruments of music of the Lord which David had made to praise the Lord saying for his mercy endures forever whenever David offered praise to their men, by their ministry. And the priest sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood. And furthermore Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the bronze, bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings. 
and the grain offerings and the fat. So incredible was this feast. I mean, guys, we're talking about a huge barbecue. I mean, that's what's going on here. I mean, these guys are cooking some serious meat. And it says that the altar, this bronze altar that was used to put the sacrifices on, was so overwhelmed by literally all of these tens of thousands of animals that, that they had to just create a place in the courtyard. He says, and he sanctified it. He says, it's okay to do a barbecue there. It's okay to do this. And they started just having this massive barbecue that went on for days and days and days. And Solomon kept the feast seven days. And Israel with all of him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly for, the, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. This is one heck of a party going on here. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for the good that the Lord had done for David, for Solomon and for his people Israel. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in his house of the Lord and in his own house. An amazing picture of worship. An amazing picture of, of this celebration, this, this dedication, this reliance upon, this commitment to God Almighty. The people, joyful. Joyful in heart. You know what's interesting? When we leave this place after worshiping and after the act of worshiping through study, because it's all worship. You guys realize we're still worshiping right now. This is all just worship. Whether it be music, whether it be study, whether it be prayer, it's all worship. We should leave more joyful than we got here by virtue of this act of dedication and service and worship to the Lord. I mean, I would hope, and I mean, there's sometimes when I kind of notice, you know, people come in and they're kind of frumpy. Sunday mornings, especially last week with daylight savings time, there were some front muffins in the first, there was some serious front muffins in the first service. They were not ready for the hour, hour of less sleep. And they showed up just because they had to because it's their habit, but they didn't want to be here. Second service was hammered, so some of them just gave up after they realized they overslept, and they just came to the second service. It was great. But worshiping God should prompt joy in our heart. It, sh it should bring joy. It should cause us to, to have this aspect, as it says, that they all left joyful. Oh, I'm sure it had a lot to do with the festivities. I'm sure it had a lot to do with the barbecue. I'm sure it had a lot to do with the fellowship and all that was taking place. But the key behind what it was is that their focus and their attention for this period of time was completely turned on the things of God. And that brought them joy. So I'm not trying to create a recipe or a formula, but I think I've found a way to put joy into our hearts. I think when we find ourselves in that place to where our joy is gone, where we're feeling depressed or we're feeling down or we're feeling beat up or we're feeling overwhelmed, that the, the thing that is going to help us to carry past it, the thing that's going to really move us to the place of where we want to be and where we know God wants us to be is going to be worship of the Lord. Now, you choose how you get to do that. I mean, for me, a lot of times it's like, turn it up. Crank it up. <laughs> the louder it goes and the steadier the beat, the happier I get, all right? Now, I know it's totally different for Jason because he listens to a totally different kind of music than I do. But it's the same kind of thing. It may be just a matter of spending time. It may be just the opposite. It may be getting totally quiet before the Lord. Maybe how we worship. But guys, this act of worship, whatever it may be, however it is that we consecrate, that we set ourselves aside, that we dedicate ourselves to the Lord is what's going to restore and bring about and allow us to be able to go then about with joy. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and he said to them, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or set pestilence among you, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
Now, we're familiar with 14. Really familiar with 14. That's got to be like one of the all-time favorite Christian verses. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. I mean, we, we, we know that one. We also know that it casts great responsibility upon us. This doesn't say if those wicked, heathen individuals in the world would fall under. This isn't what it says. If my people who are called by my name, those are, are not necessarily yet his people. They certainly aren't called by his name. But what's amazing about this is that there's something above it that we often forget. There's a warning. When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people, when hardship comes, when trials come, when the economy crashes, when the crops fail, when we're in a seven-year drought, when there's things that are coming against us that God is directing, He's trying to get the attention of His people. He's trying to get, he's trying to get our attention. And for some reason, a church runs around thinking, well, if they would just pay attention. What's wrong with those people? Well, it's all this group's fault, and it's all that group's fault, and if they get into the White House, oh my goodness, the whole world. He doesn't say... It's about them. He says, when you see this, when this happens, when there's famine and when there's no rain and when there's pestilence and when there's problems and when things are going, if my people will humble themselves. I don't know what it's going to take. I mean, I I, I really don't. I don't know what it's going to take for God to heal the lamb, but I know that it says that it starts with his people. And it's not about his people pointing out the wickedness and complaining about that which is in the world. (laughs) Complaining about what's going on is not the same as humbling ourselves and confessing our sin. It's also not about electing politically incorrect narcissistic billionaires or socialists to the White House. It's not going to solve the problem. It's not going to be that which we're going to be able to lay our hope in anything that is of man and expect there to be anything that's going to come out of it. What's going to happen is that we're either going to rely on Jesus Christ or we're going to turn our hearts to God or we're going to see a continuation of this decline because all of the time God is saying, I'm trying to get your attention. This is meant on purpose. We're not in an, we're not in an accidental situation here. The things that we see happening are happening on purpose, and it's a symbol and it's a sign of God's great love for us because those that He that He loves, He chastens. In 15, it says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, If you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I coveted it with David, your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and you go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land which i have given them and this house which i have sanctified for my name i will cast out of my sight and i'll make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples and as for this house which is exalted everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say why has the lord done this to the land and to this house then they will answer because they forsook the lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this calamity on them. I just saw that. The temple's no longer on the Temple Mount. The stones are cast down. Cast out. It's gone. The remnant, a wall. No longer. When people walk by, one of the first things that they have to think when they look at it is, how, how did this happen? 
How could it be if God is so great that, that His people no longer have a place to worship Him, that it's been given away, that it's been relegated to those that are, that are outside the things of God, that actually it's been given away to the enemy? They followed after other gods. What are we in peril of losing? Oh, we don't have the symbols maybe that they had. They had the temple. They had all of the laws of Moses that were given. Obviously a different time, a different, different set of circumstances. They were under the law. We're under grace. We know that our, our redemption comes through Jesus Christ, not through the sacrifice of bulls and lambs. But what are we, what are we challenged to give up in relationship to the gods that we're serving? I think we should always pay attention when God warns us. That's an understatement, isn't it? I mean, as the promises of God are true, so are His warnings. I mean, have you ever noticed that the very thing that you think, oh, I don't need to pay attention to that, is the one that comes back and eats your lunch? I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, if you see a promise in, in, in God's Word and you stand on it, you think this is great, and you see a warning and you go, ah, eh, that one doesn't apply to me, that's the one that comes back and smacks you. Wow. I think, unfortunately, within the church that there's times when we stay away from the warnings of God. I mean, we don't want to make God sound negative. We don't, we don't want to warn people against the things that would cause them to have problems. We, we, don't, want to, we don't want to take and, 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 and cause them to think that somehow or another that there's a downside to God. I mean, after all, God is love, and God loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Just come down to the altar and say the words and pray the prayer, and everything will be fine, and your whole life is going to be fabulous from that point on. Let me tell you the other side. Let me tell you the other side in all honesty and in all love. If I'm in the grocery store and I see somebody else's kids misbehaving, okay, I may give them the look. I may even give them the nod and the look. If they're in danger of harming themselves or somebody else, if the child is about to flip out of the basket, I may actually intervene. But for the most part, they ain't my kids. Those aren't my kids. Now, I'm not going to let them fall and let them hurt themselves and let them damage themselves, but the reality is, is that they are not my responsibility. I'm not their father. You with me? Okay, but ask my kids that are now even adults. How much dad's still around? Ask my grandkids. How much grandpa will intervene? Okay? Those are my kids. Those are my sons and my daughter-in-law's kids. They've got beautiful kids, but guess what? I tell them all the time, go home and kiss my kids. So I tell them, go home and kiss my kids. They're my kids too. See, they're my charge they're my responsibility they're my kids as long as i'm alive i'm going to i'm going to be responsible and i'm going to feel accountable and i'm going to feel the need to protect and to guide and to direct and when necessarily to discipline for their own good when we come to the lord and we become his child a child of god we then become his responsibility in the sense that we now belong to him now, I'm not saying that God doesn't care about those that aren't his children, but let me tell you what, there's an awful lot of kids out there that aren't his kids. But when you are his kid, be careful. He'll chasten you. Be careful. He loves you enough not to allow you to be able to continue in sin, to continue to do the things that he knows is bad for you without there being some serious consequences. I see it all the time, and I warn people all the time, hey, dude, don't do that, man. You know the Lord. Yeah, I know. But, he, but he's got so much grace and mercy. He's going to smack the face right off of your head. <laughs> you need to stop it because he is going to straighten and clean your clock. If you don't, you're his kid. He's not going to let you get away with this. And guys, it's because he loves us. It says that any father that doesn't discipline his child hates their child. God can't hate us. But we can refuse to be His child. And so we need to understand that there's this aspect of this, this both sides. And He tells Solomon, He says, if you do this, 
you're great. If you do that, it's all over. I'll take it all away from you. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house. It came to pass, 20 years. He spent seven years building the house of the Lord and 13 building his own house. Seven years on God's house and 13 on his own. That's pretty crazy. It said that the cities which Hiram had given to Solomon, then Solomon built and he settled the children of Israel there. And the next few verses talk about how it is that the land that was returned now is going to be occupied. And guys, (laughs) that's still a hotly protested issue right now in Israel as of today about occupied land, occupied areas. Verse 7 says, All the people who were left, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, who were not of Israel, that is, their descendants who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel did not destroy, from these Solomon raised forced labor, as it is to this day. But Solomon did not make the children of Israel servants for his work. Some were men of war, captains of his officers, captains of his chariots and his cavalry, and the others were chiefs of the officials of the king of Solomon, 250 who ruled over people. We know that this is part of the ongoing issue was that they didn't drive out that which God had drove out. They allowed or told them to. They allowed the people to stay in the land and thought that somehow if they could make them and cause them to work for them. Be careful. You can't ever, you can't ever let the things of the enemy work for you in a way that's going to bring glory to God and bring security and safety. Oh, I know that I shouldn't get involved with this guy because he's not a Christian, but we're going to do the business deal anyway. Eh. Oh, I know he's not a Christian, but I just really think he's cute. (sighs) And I'm sure that after we get together that he'll come around. Eh. Can't make a deal with the devil and expect it to turn out to be something of God. (laughs) Case in point, Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to a house he built for her, for he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of, the, of King David of Israel because the, pal- or the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy. I married her, but she's not worthy to live in my father's house. She's so bad, I don't want her to come to next to anything that's holy. Can't make this stuff up. I mean, if she was that bad, what was he doing with her in the first place? But she's so cute. (laughs) Just keep the heathen outside the holy stuff. Everything will be fine. There we go. Don't let her touch anything that's holy. And Solomon offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the vestibule, according to the daily rate, offering according to the commandment of Moses for the Sabbaths, the new moons, the three appointed yearly feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And he did according to all the order of David his father had appointed. He appointed the divisions of the priests for their services, the Levites for their duties, to praise and to serve before the priests. And the duty of each day required, and the gatekeeper by their divisions at each gate. And so David, the man of God, had commanded. And they did not depart from the commands of the kings to the priests and the Levites concerning the matter, concerning the treasures and So Solomon did everything that he had been instructed to do. He ordered everything. He put the Levites in their place. He assigned the gatekeepers. He made sure the daily sacrifices were taken care of. And it says that he he put everything in well-ordered from the day the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid until it was finished, and then it was complete. In verse 9, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions, having a very great retune of camels, and she bore spices, or that bore spices, and gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered her all of her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the servants of his waiters and their apparel, oh man, she was just flipped out. There was no spirit, it says, left within her. 
Queen of Sheba. Sheba was this area that's now modern-day Ethiopia and around Yemen and those areas. And she came and she was totally blown away with what she saw. Not only the wisdom of Solomon, but the splendor of his, of his household and, and, and the splendor of his table, the food. I mean, a Caesar's Palace Bellagio buffet had nothing on what Solomon put on the table every single day. In Kings, we're told that, that it was 300 bushels of flour daily was the, was the allotment, 600 bushels of meal, 10 prime and 20 commercial oxen. I don't know what the difference between a prime and a commercial, but evidently the prime ones were better because they mentioned them separately. 10 prime oxen and then 20 commercial. And then it was around 100 sheep plus all of the wild game and the fowl. Every day was on his table. She... <laughs> No, I couldn't find a piece of meat. All I had was a falafel, and I don't even know what was in that. It certainly wasn't meat. I think Solomon used all the meat. But this was daily, and she comes and she is blown away by the opulence. She's blown away by everything that she sees. And she said to the king, It was true, the report which I heard about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. She goes on in verse 7 and she talks about how it is that there, his servants are happy. That there's this, this continual wisdom within the house and God has blessed them and is delighted in setting him on the throne over all of Israel. And it says, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great abundance, and precious stones. There never were any spices as such those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And they're into their spices over there. And when you go through the outdoor markets, you have no idea what's out there, but they got basket upon basket upon basket of all of these spices. Stuff. And you got to be careful because some of it will hurt you. Solomon took tribute. It talks about what it is that he was given and what was brought into the king's house, wood and gold and precious stones. And in verse 12, it says, King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, much more than she had brought to the king. So she turned and went to her own country. This is from the for what it's worth category because at some point in time you may come across this on the hysterical channel or in some sort of teaching. We'll finish with this tonight. We'll finish up the rest of the chapter next week. Ethiopian history and tradition say that the queen, in, uh, along with what else she took back with her to Ethiopia, she was pregnant. She took a son. And I'm not trying to start confusion or do anything else, but what you need to understand is that there is a huge presence within the Ethiopian culture of, a, of the Jewish religion. And supposedly this is attributed to the fact that the Queen of Sheba had one of Solomon's sons who ultimately went back and was with Solomon in, in Jerusalem for a period before traveling back home. And again, this is tradition, this is some of it historical, some of it there's some accuracy in relationship to some of it. At one point in time it was said that the Ark of the Covenant literally was, was stolen or taken to Ethiopia. And if you watch some of these hysterical channel shows, they'll say that it still exists in a sacred cubicle on top of their most sacred mound, and it's in there, and there's a gatekeeper, and the Ark of the Covenant is supposedly there, right? Here's what I say. It doesn't tell us that in the Word of God. His Bible doesn't say that. If it was, if it is, it doesn't matter because it isn't anything that really affects. But if you come across that, and the only reason I'm telling you that is I don't want anybody coming in here someday and going, I saw this thing on the historical channel, and it says the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I know where it's at, and so does Indiana Jones. <laughs> you with me? All right. Next week, we'll wrap up the chapter. It just talks about Solomon's great wealth and all that he acquired as God continued to bless him. So let's pray.